August 2005, Hurricane Katrina whips South Florida, then spins up into a Category 5 monster in the Gulf of Mexico. But this isn't the story of what happened to New Orleans when the levees broke. It's the story of what happened to the people of Mississippi, where Katrina actually hit the hardest. Follow the path of destruction from inside the storm, block by block and minute by minute. When you're in the water and the wind's blowing, you couldn't get away from the sound. Experience the most dangerous hurricanes on the planet, as if you were there, caught in the eye of the storm. This is Hurricane 360. 30 miles away in Bay St. Louis, Joel Elzey is part of a 30-man team from the Hancock County Emergency Management Agency, or EMA, who monitor the approaching megastorm. All right, Jessica, I want you to... The main hub is where police is there, uh, EMA director is there, uh, Red Cross, anything that has to deal with mitigating the storm. Uh, we're all in one place together. Now, as night falls and Katrina begins to close in on the coast, the EMA team prepares for the worst. We were told by the National Weather Service that Katrina was packing 170 plus mile an hour winds. And yes, we're looking at a major, severe Category 5 hurricane, and it's catastrophic at that point. Monday, August 29th, 2005. The most destructive storm of the 21st century slams into the Gulf Coast of the United States. And while the images of devastation and chaos in the city of New Orleans will come to define the tragedy, Southern Mississippi actually bears the brunt of Katrina's impact. In the Hancock County Emergency Operations Center, Joel Elsey and other members of the emergency management team field hundreds of phone calls as Katrina's winds bombard their headquarters. At that point, once the winds get to a certain level, we pretty much hunker down, shut the doors. Most of us are around a big table, 15 phones coming in, and we're constantly answering phone calls. By the time they call them with the water, we can't get to them. We can't send law enforcement out to them. We can't send fire out to them. It's too dangerous for us to even get out there. Just tell them, keep your head, try to find a boat, you know, find something to cling on to or find something to get into. The coastal towns of Mississippi are about to be hit by one of the deadliest storms in American history. Seawater begins to surge out of the bay and up Highway 90. Before long, the Hancock County Emergency Operations Center is completely surrounded by water. We were able to take videos and pictures of signs going past the building, water going down our main Highway 90. Search and Rescue Coordinator Wade Hicks captures Katrina's impact on video. And you're hearing literally the building rip apart. We realize, you know, okay, this is getting worse, and it's getting worse, and it's getting worse, and there's no end in sight. Despite rising floodwaters, the team continues to man the phone lines. Then, as water seeps into the room, Joel takes a final call. And it was actually my director of operations. He's like, you know, what's your situation over there? I thought, well, sir, you know, we're standing in two to three foot of water. It's already in the building. And I'll never forget it. He just like, let out a, like a gas. Somebody had punched him in the gut. And he's like, oh, God. And I was like, what? The National Weather Service predicts that Bay St. Louis will see at least 10 more feet of water. I thought, you know, we'll be dead if we get 10 more feet of water. He's like, I know and there's no way to get you out. And now, there's nowhere for all that water to go other than the low-lying communities of the Gulf Coast. We have right at 185 square miles of low-lying area. And what I mean by low-lying area is area that gets inundated with water just on a high tide and a good southeast wind. 
Brian Adam and his fellow emergency management workers are standing in knee-deep water inside the Hancock County Emergency Operations Center. Joel Elzey receives a call from a supervisor who is based in another city. He learns that at least 10 more feet of water is expected in Bay St. Louis. He said, well, he says, there's nothing we can do to help. Is there anything you would like to say to your family? Give them a message of any sort. Because the potential of you making it out of there is not looking good. Elsie's four-year-old son, Jax, is 100 miles north in Jones County with his grandparents, far from the storm-ravaged coast. He's four, and we're just really get to where we have a father-son bond, and I'm not gonna be around the rest of his life. Said what I had to say to give him something that he could hear and what not to forget about me. gathers his team for a meeting. And water's coming in, what do we do? One, we was gonna fight our best to, to, to stay afloat and stay alive. But in case something happened, we decided to go ahead and write the numbers and do the list. We need to start somewhere and pick a number and go right on down the line. And remember what your number is. This thing can get real tricky. One by one, Adam. Joel Elzey and the team of men and women trapped inside take a number and write it down on a list beside their names. We each had a you know, designated number and we took a magic marker and marked a number on our skin. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. We hoped nothing would happen, but what if in just case and our building fell down or the bodies kind of washed around, they wouldn't really know by the time they got to us who we were. So we wanted to make sure everybody could be identified. What we did was put up a uh, list of names taped high up on the wall in case something did happen where they could identify us. So we thought it was that serious. Joel Elzey and the men and women of the Hancock County Emergency Operations Center have just spent the past several hours watching the floodwaters rise and are preparing themselves for the worst. But later that day, Katrina's peak winds let up. The storm tide is receding and the hurricane moves north. Elsie and his colleagues are now determined to evacuate the building and face whatever waits for them outside. And we just pretty much uh, say to ourselves, you know, I'm not drowning in this building. I'm not dying in this building. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die trying to help. I'm going to do what I can to help the citizens just like I'm supposed to do. And if I die in the, in the process, that's fine. Members of the EMA team now venture out to rescue survivors and get a first-hand look at what Katrina has left in its wake. The challenging part was, one, there wasn't a lot of vehicles to use to go get them. We commandeered buses. We, we commandeered whatever we can commandeer to drive down what roads we could get down to and start picking people up. An ex-police chief got a bus that was running and just started driving, picking people up. People started walking out of their areas just in shock, and it was unbelievable. Seeing the destruction that was there, we wouldn't even have come close to even guessing this was what was going to happen. Joel Elsey had recorded a heartbreaking farewell to his loved ones. After 21 days on duty, Joel reunited with his four-year-old son, Jax, who rode out the storm 100 miles away with his grandparents. And actually getting to see him and, you know, put my eyes on him, and it was uh, the best hug I ever got. He just latched on, and, and I did too. And uh, 
We just stood there and just, and just hugged. It was over at that point. I can start breathing again. In all, Katrina causes more than $100 billion worth of damage. Wipes out scores of buildings and leaves thousands of people in Mississippi homeless.